Hi, everyone. It's May. Welcome to another episode of The May Lee Show. I'm so glad you could join me, um, either by podcast on your favorite po podcast platform or on YouTube in video form. Uh, and I never do this, so I'm going to do it once. Um, maybe I've done it one other time. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, The May Lee Show, please do. Uh, you know, it's free. It's not going to cost you anything. So uh, go ahead and subscribe. Easy peasy. Uh, and then also, if you listen by podcast and you like the show, uh, go ahead and give us a rating and even a review if you'd like. Um, it always helps us out to hear from you. So please do that. T t just take a second to do that if you can. Uh, much appreciated. Okay, my plug time is over. Um, before I get to today's episode, which is really fantastic and very empowering, um, I want to talk about one thing that is being talked about constantly. You kind of can't get away from it. It's like every other social media post is about this. Uh, people on TV are talking about it in entertainment, in news, late night. I mean, there's just so many references to it. What am I talking about? Squid Game. Yes, the Netflix TV show from South Korea, which is just like crazy out of control, huge hit. It is now the biggest hit for Netflix ever. Um, went way past Bridgerton um, and many other shows that have been hugely successful. So that is phenomenal. I mean, as a Korean, of course, it makes me personally very proud. But on a bigger scale, I'll tell you why this is so significant. It's, it, it's because this is a show that obviously is in the Korean language and it's an all Korean cast. Um, obviously the theme of it is quite interesting, dystopian, you know, very violent, but really intricate sort of storyline. And, you know, I mean, most of us have seen it. I, I recently finished it, so I can now talk about it, you know, in a pretty informed way. Most of us have seen it. Uh, actually probably, no, my, my mom has not seen it and she has no interest because she's just not her cup of tea. Uh, too violent, too weird. Uh, but anyway, besides my mom and maybe a few other people, most of us have seen it. Don't worry, I'm not going to give you any spoilers just in case you haven't seen it yet. But why this is so significant um, is that it is a Korean, South Korean production in Korean language with an all Korean cast. And so for it to be such a worldwide hit like this across the board means that people are finally wanting to watch content that is coming from somewhere that maybe they don't connect with, identify with in terms of the culture, the language, et cetera. Um, but they're willing to bypass that. They're willing to read the subtitles or listen to, listen to the dub and try to understand the storyline because it's so good. You know, back in the day, people didn't want to consume foreign content, right? Because of those hurdles of the subtitles and the language and, you know, the cultural lack of understanding. But we are now starting to see people receive that and, and embrace it because it's so good. And this is a real big step, to be honest. Um, it happened with Parasite, right? And Bong Joon-ho, Joon -ho, Bong Joon-ho, the director, had said when he received, I believe it was the Academy Award, that you know people should just get past that lower third um, and just get past it to be able to open up the doors to great content. And he, what he meant by that, just get past the subtitles. You know, don't let that be a deterrent. So I love the fact that now this is happening more, where people are willing to give something different a try. And then they're so pleasantly surprised. Well, with Squid Game, I think we were all like shocked at, you know, what this show is about and uh, how it was produced. But it makes me really happy to see that the world is starting to appreciate content from different places and Asian content. It's been great for a long time. It's just that no one wanted to take notice um, until it started becoming bigger and more popular. Um, and certainly South Korea is producing some phenomenal content uh, in terms of television and film and music. So it makes me proud. This Korean American girl is certainly proud because at, growing up as a kid, 
you know, in a pretty white community uh, surrounded by just Western, you know, ideals, I never thought this day would come where the world would just be like freaking out about a South Korean uh, series on Netflix. So um, I could talk about this, but, you know, here's the thing. There are many layers to uh, Squid Game that people are talking about, a lot of analysis. The writer-director um, just recently gave an interview, and he was talking about the many layers of themes that he, you know, drew upon um, that come from, you know, reality. Um, the greed, the, the bank failures, the politics, the division, um, the poverty, the super rich. And so it's, it's fascinating to see what he was thinking while he was writing the show. He says he's under tremendous pressure to write season two now because of the huge success. He certainly didn't expect it. The poor guy, I'm sure he's totally under pressure. Can you imagine having to write the next season? Um, but he did mention that one of the characters, um, in an episode, of Squid Game, and this is not going to be a spoiler, but he said one of the characters he loosely based on Donald Trump. And when he mentioned this in the article, I was like, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> oh. Anyway, that's a little tease. No spoiler, though. Okay. All right, let me move on now to the episode for today. Um, I was able to interview a, a, a real dynamic young Asian female entrepreneur. Her name is Sarah Wen, and she started the Wen Coffee Supply Company. Um, and she knew, not, knew nothing about coffee, actually. She was actually a journalist, a storyteller, teller, a documentarian. She even had opened up a restaurant at one point in New York. So she's kind of a jack of all trades. But she discovered something very, very interesting about Vietnamese coffee that she herself did not know, that most people don't know. And that is that Vietnamese coffee, uh, well, Vietnam is the second largest producer of coffee in the world, in the world. No one really knows that fact. Why? Well, Sara's theory, and I agree with it, is because we have this narrative that has been controlled uh, by the gatekeepers who say, well, Arabica coffee from Brazil and South America is the best, and all other coffee is inferior, and certainly Vietnamese coffee is inferior. That's the narrative. So she decided to take it upon herself to change this narrative and to build this company from the ground up. And we're talking like going to Vietnam and sourcing the coffee from producers um, in Vietnam and then bringing it back and roasting it and selling it and trying to build this company. It's a fascinating story on so many levels because her story and about Vietnamese coffee to me is a metaphor in many ways, to how Asians in general have been treated and invisibilized and seen as inferior uh, in many ways. So this is a story that truly is a metaphor in terms of what the Asian community has been going through for so long. So I really enjoyed uh, this interview. She is a powerhouse. She's dynamic. She's driven. She's very purposeful in what she does. So here is my interview with Sarah. Sarah, welcome to the show. It's so good to meet you. Oh, likewise. Thank you for having me, May. Of course. Well, there's so much to get into with you. And um, I might I just start off by saying I am a lot older than you, but you have done so much in your life already that um, I don't even know where to begin. But congratulations on all your success so far. It's a pretty phenomenal story that you have. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Yeah. Well, Sarah, so, you know, uh, we just celebrated National Coffee Day recently. And um, who doesn't love coffee? Uh, uh, but no. <laughs> obviously, you have this coffee company, a uh, Vietnamese coffee company called Wen Coffee Supply. And I love the story of how you actually started this because it's not like you knew shit about coffee. I mean, I did you like drinking it. Thing. You liked drinking it just like we all did, but that's about the extent of your coffee knowledge. Exactly. But the fact that you then found out about Vietnamese coffee and how prominent um, it is in terms of 
the production and all of that. Nobody knows this. Right. Vietnam being the second largest producer of coffee in the world. Right. You found that out and you're like, how the hell did I not know this? Right. As a Vietnamese American, I was like, I was shocked. I was like, yeah. this is messed up that I didn't know this. And it's messed up that more people don't know this. But, you know, OK, it's one thing to uh, learn a fact about, you know, something you love, coffee, and then finding out that, you know, your heritage, you, your the country of your origin produces the second largest amount of coffee. But then to take it to the next step and say, I'm going to do something about it to promote it and let the world know that there are great coffee producers, the coffee is great, you know, and there's this original kind of coffee coming out of, uh, of Vietnam. That's a whole nother sort of level of ambition and drive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So tell me wh why, just, just first of all, why? You know, May, I felt like I, I really felt personally affected that there was such an injustice being done to Vietnam, to the Vietnamese community, to the Vietnamese coffee growers. Right. And I, I think I related a lot just like being a first generation Asian American, Vietnamese American growing up in the 90s. Right. Where I felt rendered invisible all the time. Right. This was pre social media. I didn't grow up with Instagram or Facebook. Yeah. And so for a first gen like myself, I the feeling of being invisible or non represented was something that I've struggled with my whole life. And that has actually become, become a big part of my mission um, as I carved a career in media and filmmaking where I was super passionate about increasing representation, about telling our stories and helping my community be seen. And I thought that if I could help our stories be seen, that it would just kind of like help interracial relationships across the board, right? Sure. So it was that common thread of like, I've been rendered invisible, the Asian American community has been rendered invisible, and now Vietnamese coffee has been rendered invisible as well in the global conversation. Right. It was that connection that really set this entire spark in my in my journey to start the company. Cause I was like, this is so much more than just about um, you know, this the idea of being seen in representation, but mainly May, I'm sorry. With any non-transparent supply chain, at the end of it, there's always exploitation, right? Yep. There's economic exploitation. So for me, it was, yes, it's about telling our stories being seen, but it's also about changing the entire industry and supply chain to elevate the lives of the yeah. people behind the world's second largest producing, the refined, elevating the lives of the people behind the world's second largest coffee producing region, right? right and right. that for me was where I felt like it, this it really needed to change because it wasn't just about stories, it was about lives at the end yeah, of Yeah, no, and what I like about that, what I love about that actually is you're so right when it comes to people consuming, right? We're all consumers. We rarely think about where something comes from and the people that produce it and, you know, the sacrifices they make until it becomes a big story where it's an investigative report or something like that. Right. But until that right. happens, most of us go about our everyday lives consuming, consuming, consuming and never thinking about the origin of a product. So you decided, you know what, I'm going to change that. I'm going to make this single origin. I'm going to, you know, find, you know, tell the story about how Vietnamese coffee is is, uh, you know, produced and the fact that it's delicious and we can't go through this exploitation anymore because what was happening, you said, you found out that a lot of Vietnamese coffee was being used in different forms, but never recognized right. as Vietnamese coffee. It was just coffee. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, and that relates to this larger trend or behavior may that we see of just the devaluing of Asian culture, right. the devaluing of Asian food, the devaluing Asian beverages. Right. We see all the time when people are like, oh, why is that bowl of pho so expensive? Why, how, why is it $18 for a bowl? It should be $6 for a bowl. Yeah. But meanwhile, people never question the cost of a plate, um, the cost of, you know, plate of pasta. Right. Right. And the same thing was happening with you know, Chinese food and Vietnamese coffee, Vietnamese coffee should be cheap. When we attach these ideas of Asian food and culture and beverage should be cheap, that directly relates to the lives behind the yes. producer, right? Yes. And then we talk about this uptick in, you know, anti-Asian violence is because people are so ingrained with devaluing Asian culture, which means they devalue Asian lives. And where does that come from? It's historic. People have to understand that this has been happening for 150 plus years in America, for sure, yeah. that Asian yeah. lives have been less than, yeah. worth less. Um, mm -hmm. subhuman. And we yeah. see that all the way on through all the way up to the Atlanta shootings and beyond, you know, and that's why all of this stuff is still happening. So, so when you started researching then and finding out, you know, how beautiful Vietnamese coffee is and the quality mm -hmm. and look, I've been to Vietnam many times and I even have my little, my little filter. 
I know Cute. it's a little beat up, but it's because I use it all the time. Yeah. Um, when you go to Vietnam, coffee's everywhere. Yeah. There are coffee shops everywhere. There are roasters everywhere, like little tiny stalls, little tiny stores everywhere. And so mm -hmm. they obviously understand how good their coffee is. Why right. do you think that is that Vietnam and Vietnamese coffee has been so underrated versus, for instance, Brazilian coffee, Colombian right. coffee, right? That's what people right. know. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. You know, there are so many theories as to why this is. And the, the way I like to think about it is with any industry, there are gatekeepers, right? They're the gatekeepers of an industry and they dictate what is valuable, what is not valuable, what is superior, what is inferior, right? Um, we see it in fashion, right? Literally every year in fashion, there are people who come together and say, this is the color of the year. And that <laughs> dictates everything that we see afterwards, right? Yeah, yeah. Same thing with coffee, right? So I can only kind of draw conclusions as to like, well, who has a vested interest in keeping Vietnamese coffee down? Who has a vested interest in elevating Arabica coffee as a superior bean? Who has a vested interest in um, keeping the price of Vietnamese coffee down so that they can purchase it for a cheaper price and then produce a cheaper product, right? So I don't know exactly who these companies are. I can't quite point to it. Maybe a journalist out there would want to do some digging, but that's the general theme of like what happens with exploitation, right? And so historically, yes, historically, Vietnamese coffee has primarily been pushed into the instant coffee market, right? Which is generally seen as a cheaper product. Yeah. However, at the end of the day, it is a product in a bean and Vietnamese coffee can be grown great and it can be grown poorly, right? But to say that all Vietnamese coffee is poor or cheap or gross, is just not right because right. that's a social construct. We can can actually invest in it to make it better if we wanted to, but who wants to and who doesn't want to? Yeah, I've had some of the best coffee I've ever had in Vietnam. And I'm not just saying that it is so good. It is so rich. Um, I, yes. I'll, tell, I'll tell you a story about uh, my coffee hunt. So I was told about the famous egg coffee uh, drink mm -hmm. in Vietnam. And so I had to find the best cup of egg coffee. And I asked my Vietnamese yeah. friends in Hanoi, I, I was in Hanoi at the time. They said, oh, you have to go to Ding Cafe. And so I said, okay, mm -hmm. I'll find it. I'm searching around, searching around. I can't find it. Finally, I see this tiny little sign and this arrow, this rickety arrow pointing down this like hallway, right? And then I go up two like rickety staircases. I'm going, oh, yeah. there can't be a cafe. But sure enough, I get up there and there's a small little cafe, kind of dark, packed yeah. with people. And they made the most amazing egg coffee here. I'll, I'll, I'll show you a picture of it because this... Here it is. Do you see it? Wow. Yeah. It was yeah. delicious. It was delicious. And so it is one of those things where, again, if you, they're given the chance, right? If people give Vietnamese coffee a chance, they're going to realize how great it is. And then let's talk about the Robusta bean, which is what yeah. Viet Vietnam is uh, known for, right? Exactly. Twice as strong in terms of caffeine, um, mm -hmm. twice as many antioxidants, et cetera, et cetera. All of these really wonderful qualities. Yeah. But again, it's sort of poo pooed or sort of dis has been dismissed. Right? Yes, totally. Yeah. Yeah. So Vietnam's primary coffee production is the Robusta bean. Um, you know, it, it varies, but it's around like 90 to 95 percent of Vietnam's entire coffee production. And on top of that, Vietnam is the number one producer of Robusta coffee in the world. Right. Yeah. So when we think about Vietnamese coffee culture, the Robusta bean is a really big part of that conversation, which is why with the profile of Robusta beans being like highly caffeinated, also 60 percent less fats and sugars, which means it's very bold and dark chocolate and nutty, yeah. um, it tastes great in these drinks like egg coffee, right? Or with sweet condensed milk or even black, really, if that's your cup of coffee. Yeah. Um, and so, but yes, you're right, May, like Vietnamese coffee, but more specifically, the Robusta bean has really been dismissed and devalued, which is unfortunate because that's like saying lemons are superior and limes are inferior <laughs> and lemons are the best citrus and limes are cheap and gross, right? right when right. they're just two different varieties, how can right. we apply these notions onto it? And when we apply these notions on preferences or like preferential superior beans, it literally traps the entire robust supply chain into yeah. poverty. Right. 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 So that's where these narratives become so harmful. Yeah. I see you, you use the word that, that I always use when I teach my classes. It's the narratives that have been controlled. Right. And yeah. so whether they're right or wrong, whether it's fact or fiction, the narrative is a powerful tool to control the way people think information. Yes. Right. People are programmed yeah. to think, for instance, that 
Brazilian Colombia coffee, Arabica coffee is the best. And everything yes. else is, you know, is, is deemed less superior than that. Right. And it's programming. Right. When, it's not pe like people right. really know. It's just that, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. That's that's what they say. Right. Yeah. Right. When when why can't we just have a conversation of saying this is what Arabic is about and this is what Rabat is about? Right. Try both of them. And where do you land? What, what do you like? Right. Coffee is such a personal and subjective experience. Yeah. It's ridiculous that that anyone in the industry would say, if you're not drinking 100% Arabica, then you're not drinking good coffee, right? That just doesn't make sense in any yeah, way. Exactly, exactly. Variety is, is the spice of life. Why wouldn't you want more variety? So let's go back to how you all started, because again, before I said you didn't know shit about do, you know the coffee business or <laughs> roasting coffee or anything, you pretty much had to start from scratch. Um, yeah. What were some of the major hurdles for you? Um, in getting this business started, because I'm sure even like export, import, all of that stuff. I mean, that's, that's a crazy business to get into anyway. Yeah, it really was. And so, you know, we are a direct trade importer and roaster. We're entirely vertically integrated. Um, and may it, it's extremely complicated and it wasn't necessarily like my preference, but literally we had to start importing ourselves because I could not find any other importers offering a single origin baby's coffee bean. Right. Huh. I would have been fine just roasting and packaging, but I literally went to all these major greenhouses or green buyers or importers could not find a single origin baby's coffee beans. I was like, well, I guess I need to go direct to the source. And that's what I did. Right. Okay. Most of my family, um, my family relatives are all in Vietnam. So I have a huge network over there. I'm very close to my family in Vietnam. And in 2016, I was actually filming a documentary for NBC news in Cambodia. I made a pit stop to visit my family in Vietnam. And I was like, Hey fam, like I'm thinking about importing Vietnamese these coffee. Does anyone know someone with a farm? And my aunt was like, actually I do know someone. He's a good friend from my company and he left the company to take over his family farm. And so that was how it first happened in 2016. We took a plane from Hanoi to Da Lat okay. to meet up with my current producing partner. And that was the beginning of it. And then from there, it was just like a lot of Googling, right. And a lot of picking up the phone and I would literally Google something and pick up the phone and call this entity and then call this entity. And I'd say, I'm trying to get from point A to point B. What do I need to do? What documents do I need to have? Who do I need to talk to? And then they would directly to the next, the next person to talk to. And it was literally like putting a puzzle together wow. until eventually we had our first pallet arrive. And then um, at the same time, I was learning how to roast. Learning how you had to learn how to roast coffee. <laughs> I had to learn how to roast because May. <laughs> There was no one else roasting Vietnamese coffee, let alone robust coffee beans, right? Oh, wow. At the time, I was working out of a shared roasting facility in Brooklyn where we rent the machine per hour. Okay. And when my pallet arrived, the people at the, at the facility were like, we've never had a Vietnamese bean in here, let alone a robusta bean in here, oh, right? So no one knew how to roast in. No one was really open to it because in the industry, like there were a lot of stigma. They'd be like, oh, you're roasting that? Uh -huh. Okay, that's kind of gross, right? Yeah, they yeah. would literally tell me like, yeah, I don't roast robusta because it tastes like grandma's socks. Like literally oh, to my no, face. Oh, like, really? Yeah. And I was like, but you've never roasted robusta. So why would you say that? Right. You get these narratives that people become so fixated on and they just spew it because they think that if they say it, they know a thing or two about the industry when right. really it's just perpetuation. Wow. Just, right? uh, just pure so, ignorance. Okay. Okay. So you yeah, were like, so I, screw I took the that. roasting course and I learned how to roast. <laughs> wow. Okay. Okay. So, so then you got that sort of mastered yourself. So yeah. you started roasting your own beans. So then yeah. the process of convincing people, right. Um, to get over the stigma or the unknown, you know, people don't like to try something new sometimes. Right. Especially if it's, right. if it's foreign. Right. Um, right. So what was that like to try to get right. that ball rolling and convince people that this was good coffee? You know, when it came to like people in the industry, like people who were working specialty coffee, yeah. I didn't really, I didn't care to convince them. Right. Okay. But when it came to yeah. consumers in my community, in the audiences, may these stigmas didn't actually trickle down to the consumer level. Okay. So there was no convincing that needed to happen. People from the jump were like, I love Vietnamese coffee. This tastes amazing. Oh, what is it? Oh, it's Robusta. That's cool. What is that? Right. It was actually a very different experience. So huh. there was no hurdle in convincing our audience and our consumers, but the industry were like, you know, I'd go to like a coffee festival. I compete in like roasting competitions and people were like, man, but I never cared about seeking their approval because if I did, I wouldn't have started this company. Right. Right. Because right. the, the industry was already telling me Vietnamese coffee is gross, Vietnamese coffee is cheap, and it has no place in specialty coffee. Yeah. If I ever cared about that, I wouldn't have started it, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. as I was building the company, 
I just did my thing. I came into like the New York Coffee Festival 2019 as the only company offering single origin Vietnamese coffee beans, the only company offering like fresh roasted robusta beans, the only company demoing the fiend filter. Um, and we had a crowd the entire weekend around our booth because we were doing something so different. And regardless of what the industry gatekeepers or the industry folks thought, our audience were excited about diversity. They're excited about something new. Yeah. And so on that perspective, there was no there was no hurdle. There was actually a lot of embrace. Uh, yeah. You know, I can see that you going just direct to consumer, right? Because they're going to have the appreciation for something new rather than, like you said, the gatekeepers or the, the big, big coffee companies that actually don't want a disruptor like you, right? Because you really right. are a disrupt disruptor in, in this uh, business. Right. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I am. Um, they don't want to disrupt like me because it disrupts their narrative yeah. and disrupts what they're promoting, what they're holding up. Right. right. Um, and so but I will tell you, May. A lot of people in the industry are coming around and oh. it's incredible to see. Really? It's incredible to see. I had someone, um, I won't mention the name of the company, but I had someone from a major green bean importer who were very friendly with um, DM me and say, like last week, it was National Coffee Day, International Coffee Day. And he DM'd me. He's like, hey, by the way, I want you to know we've been seeing an uptick in requests for Robusta beans. And I think you have something to do with it. Right. Of course um, you have something to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> and and I will say there are a lot of people in the industry who have been super supportive, like especially Coffee Association has like done events with us. James Beard Foundation has done events with us. You know, other coffee roasters. I want to I want to acknowledge the people who have been supportive and the yeah. people who have been like, hey, Thank you for challenging my perspective about robust and Vietnamese coffee. I, I never realized how harmful this was. Or like, hey, thank you for changing the narrative. Like, um, this is actually this actually makes a lot of sense, right? So th a lot of people are actually coming around, and it's yeah. really exciting to oh see. Oh my god, that's awesome, Sarah. Yeah. I'm very proud of you for doing that <laughs> um, and sticking with it because I'm sure it has not been easy and continues to be somewhat challenging. But you know, it's that's, crazy. That's what drive. <laughs> hey, listen, folks, this is what drive looks like and focus and purpose, because clearly yeah. purpose has been driving you to do this. So congratulations on that. Okay, so yeah. this is uh, this is something I was wondering about too. As we all know, even if it's 2021, um, women in business, women entrepreneurs, especially if you're going against establishment like you've been, mm -hmm. I'm sure you've run into that hurdle as well as a woman, as a young woman and a woman of color. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me about that experience and how that's been for you and how you've been able to just, you know, kind of persist. That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I feel like I've definitely been in conversations with different people, primarily men, whether they're like in a retail buying position or some other influential decision making position where I feel like um, I'm entering a lot of skepticism or doubt about my ability to either lead this company or like lead this change. Um, so I've, I've definitely come across those, those conversations, but for the most part, May, you know, I get asked this question a lot. And for the most part, I feel like being a woman, especially being a woman of color and a Vietnamese American woman has been such an incredible advantage mm. to me because I'm able to bring a super unique perspective that no one else has been able to bring to the industry, which is why I am a disruptor and which is why I was featured on the cover of food and wine as a yeah. game changer, right? right? It is my experience, my perspective as a first generation woman of color, Vietnamese American, that is my advantage right now. So I try to do that reframe, you know, about like really what is my superpower and how it's rooted in my identity. And while there are people who kind of deal with their own perceptions and biases of like women in business, I deal with it the best I can. And ultimately, like the people who want to be a part of this journey will join us, you know, yeah. and I think we're seeing a lot of people are really um, coming around. I'm so glad to hear you say that about using your, um, who you are as a woman, as a Vietnamese woman, as a superpower. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanna get into this conversation now because I think it's really important to, to talk about because I'm seeing this all around me still. Uh, again, it's 2021. I grew up in the 70s, right? Mm -hmm. As an Asian kid in Ohio. So it was a very different time. So you can imagine the struggles I've been through. Yeah. But Disappoints me and breaks my heart still is when I still hear young people talk about the racism and the struggle and the identity crisis and the me being made to feel less than and uh, undervalued. Um, and again, I'm seeing this a lot more with Asian, young Asian women um, feeling this way, still feeling this way. 
still feeling undervalued and less than and questioning their identity and not seeing who they are as an advantage rather as a disability almost. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for you to say that, that you see your identity as a woman, as an Asian woman, as a superpower rather than a disadvantage is a great message to send. So yeah. tell me then, did you arrive to that, this place after some time? Did something happen? Did, did it trigger? What was it an awakening of some sort for you? Tell me how you mm. arrived to that place. Mm, great question. I feel like my sense of, you know, self-awareness and self-confidence and empowerment started at a really young age. I was quite fortunate in high school to join a youth activist organization um, called the Coalition for Asian Pacific American Youth that was actually housed inside the Asian American Studies program at UMass Boston. Mm -hmm. So when I was in high school, I had exposure to, you know, ethnic studies professors and mentors who really helped shape my political perspective and my political consciousness, which has led me on my lifelong path of activism, right? You're lucky. Um, I, You're lucky that you I'm got it very so early. Lucky. Yeah. Very lucky. Yeah. yeah. And because so at a young age, I had the tools and the language to understand yeah. what I was feeling as an invisible Asian American. I had the tools and language to understand systemic oppression, systemic racism, and to know that like what I was feeling wasn't really my fault, right? It was actually the system that was designed to keep me down. Yeah. And so from there, you know, I applied straight into UCLA as an Asian American studies major. So I've always been very deeply committed in this path of activism and like political consciousness and awakening. Yeah. Um, and, but in, 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 in terms of business, like it's like a twofold thing, right? It's like, yes, I can enter every space with this confidence of like, I, me being a woman of color is my superpower. And I could be in a room with someone who just doesn't believe that. Right. So I will still, you know, hit, you know, approach like walls and hurdles. Yeah. Um, I'll share a, a little example where, you know, I was talking to, I'm in a conversation with a retail buyer from like a major retail buyer for over a year over email about getting our coffee into their stores. And it was just kind of like, they were friendly, but they were like, not the right time, not the right time. Oh, we don't really mess with Robusta. We only do Arabica, right? All the stigmas of Vietnamese coffee, the Robusta bean, and I'm sure perhaps me as a woman, um, kind of like kept me like on outside of their gates, right? However, very recently I was able to talk to two other women in the same company. Uh, one was a woman of color and another was a woman and they heard me out. They came to visit me at my roastery for the first time. Um, and they like, they understood like, this makes sense. Oh, I love your mission. Oh, diversity, sustainability, inclusion, like this all makes sense. Right. And now these two women have been, have become my advocates in this company and talking about us to their superiors and their colleagues. And now the person who I've been talking to for over a year finally follows up and says, it looks like our stance of Robusta is softening. We'd love to explore this again with oh, you. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> right. And yeah. so the moral story there is, we show up and we're going to show up how we show. And it may take 12 months. It may take five years. Who knows? But like, that's what we can control. And we can't control other people. However, I will say one of the best things about those business may is meeting other women yes. like me yes. in these different seats of yeah. the entire supply chain and entire system of influential decision-making seats. And that is how we change the tide together. That's it is right. truly a collective effort and it takes a whole village of people to kind of like connect with the perspective and then advocate on yeah. all sides. Right. No, Sarah, yeah. that's why you, we hear this over and over again, but this is meaningful. So this is a perfect example. Representation matters. So yes. you need these p people, women, people of color, you know, the, the all sorts of d diversity at the table yes. in positions where they can make decisions and yes. they can help others. If yes. those two women were not within that company mm -hmm. and found you and started talking to you, they probably, you probably wouldn't have gotten this far at, at this point with this company, right? You're saying right. because there were two women, one was a woman of color they were a little mm -hmm. bit more open-minded because they probably were more empathetic. You know, Maybe. they kind of got it right yeah. on a different level. And that's the importance of that kind of representation in all forms. Yes. All forms yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So therefore people like you and I, I mean, that's why we do the work we do because we know it's important to try to open those gates, open those doors and right. be at that table to have right. that conversation, to open up people's minds or else, 
if it's a boys club, let's let's be straight, let's be real. If it's a white boys club, you know, in different industries, that's all they're going to see. Why would they ever right. take those blinders off, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so, okay, so for you, you clearly have already experienced uh, mm -hmm. those differences and how those small differences can make a big difference in business and in life. Yeah, Yeah. totally. Yeah. Now, it's, you, it's step by step, it's happening. It's step by, yeah, baby steps, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and we all know after this last almost two years of anti-Asian hate, and which continues, mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I keep on thumping my pounding my fist on the table saying it's not over. It's not over. Mm -hmm. Even though mainstream media has moved on, uh, this problem still persists. So we have to continue the fight and continue being vocal. Um, your exactly. activism, like you said, started in high school, but then through college. And then you got into storytelling as a journalist and filmmaker and all sorts of things. So clearly that's always been a firm foundation for you. And you continue that even through coffee. Um, yes. Where does that come from? Uh, because your parents, they're mm -hmm. refugees. You know, they mm -hmm. have the story of coming, you know, escaping Vietnam on boats separately right? Uh, yep. Then finally yep. making it to the Un United States where you were born. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think it's in your blood somehow to be this fighter, um, to, to fight for justice because of your background? I mean, I think about that too. My family went through a lot, in, you know, in Korea with everything from Japanese yeah. occupation, World War II, Korean War, all of that. So sometimes I think that nature is in me to just continue mm. fighting. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. Yeah. My parents were each like 18 years old when they escaped the country in a boat, right? Like 18 years old, like they were kids. Yeah. And prior to that, they lived through a war on the home turf where they could hear bombs in the distance. Yeah. Right. And so, yeah, I guess I, I definitely think that it makes sense that there is like a bit of a fighter survivor DNA in me. Like my parents had the courage and the passion for life to to risk it all to escape because they wanted freedom and they wanted opportunity and they didn't accept whatever was the status quo around them. They they went out and they fought for life and they fought for more. So yeah, I think that must be in my DNA somewhere in there. Yeah. And both my parents are actually entrepreneurs themselves. They're both small business owners. My mom has owned a laundromat and dry cleaner for most of my life. And my dad um, owned a, f a house painting business and now he owns a floor standing business. So growing up, I saw my parents kind of like shape their own lives through their work. Yeah. Um, they weren't scalable businesses, but they did, they were entrepreneurs. So I think a lot of it comes from that as well. And they worked hard. I mean, mm -hmm. that's, that's the, that's the story of so many immigrants, right? Yeah. They come here seeking that better life and they work their asses off. Yeah. Right. 24 seven. Um, and yep. they made those sacrifices again for themselves, but also their future family. And you were born here and clearly you're doing well. And I know you have two other sisters, right? Yeah, I have um, an older sister who's two years older than me. We're, we're all very close and a younger sister who's nine years younger than me. Okay. Um, and we're all very close and everyone's amazing their own way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So are you, but are you the, 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 the kid in the family who kind of like, I, I would, I don't want to say black sheep because that's like a negative connotation, but you know, you're kind of like the sort of the, the one that kind of went off on her own and did something different and all that. <laughs> you know, all the stereotypes I have to say about the middle child, I feel like are quite true. Oh. <laughs> right? It's like the first child's like photos, 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 photos. We love the first child. Second child's like, oh my God, we're so tired. Like I have no photos of me as a kid, right? Oh, because no. my parents like tired, right? And then it's like, it's really true. And like now my friends who I have in like, second kids yeah they're like oh like i don't take photos anymore i'm like see that's the second child middle oh. child <laughs> yeah because like so that's yeah i do think i'm definitely very independent i was the only one to go far away for school yeah. okay okay but uh, you obviously had that independent streak in you always so and that continues yeah and but your yeah. parents i'm sure are are proud of the work that you're doing and and supportive they are very proud and very supportive yes yeah, yeah. so what's next for you sarah because uh well tell me how the business okay this is what I want to know. COVID obviously affected all businesses. Mm -hmm. um, I know you do kind of direct to consumer online, you know, ordering things like that, but the supply still has to come from Vietnam and clearly COVID sort of shut everything down for a while. How yeah. have you navigated COVID and how's your business doing now? 
Yeah, the supply chains have been very, very difficult. Um, Vietnam has been in lockdown for the last few months. So we weren't able to, you know, fortunately, when it came to the green beans, we were able to call a, a container of green beans right before lockdown, right? So our container of green beans came in time. However, um, the bean filters, which also come from Vietnam, you know, are really backed up because no one's able to work right now. So we, so it's difficult. Um, and so, but luckily we haven't he- had any shortages yet and Vietnam is starting to reopen. So fingers crossed that we can manage our inventory um, in, in time so that, not, so that we don't run into shortages. Yeah. I will say though, on the, the freight perspective, um, global freight has been a nightmare. Yeah. The cost of freight, everything is backed up. Um, um, we're planning way far in advance for things and the prices of freight have just quadrupled. Yeah, you know, so I've heard it's crazy how much they're charging now for like containers and stuff, right? It's, insane. Oh. it's four times what I'm used to oh. and there's just no way around it, wow. really. Yeah. Um, so other, so that's the logistical supply chain issue. And in terms of like the business, you know, we, we've always been direct to consumer e-commerce. Um, we don't have a brick and mortar or cafe. A lot of that was pure resources. We didn't have the money to do that. And so fortunately we've been able to grow during the pandemic and keep all of our staff on team. We were able to hire more people and really be, and really be able to kind of like su- sustain our team during the pandemic. Right. Okay. Okay. So you're feeling okay about how things are right now for you guys. Yeah, for now, for now, we're, we should be okay for the rest of the year, but you know, fingers crossed that's crossed that Vietnam is, you know, are they able to open up soon, depending on how the vaccines go and just fingers crossed that everyone is just comes out healthy from the pandemic. Right. Right. What would you, how would, what, what, what's your future of this business? I mean, what's your vision? Where do you want to take it? Yeah. So our vision is to build um, the next biggest coffee brand for the world that's rooted in Vietnamese coffee and Vietnamese coffee culture. When we think about all the major global coffee players today, it's their brands like Lavazza or Illy or Stumptown. Yeah. They've always been brands that are rooted in a Western or an Italian culture identity, yep. even though none of these regions grow coffee, right? <laughs> it just doesn't make sense to me, right? Wait, you know so- what? Wait, 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 wait. Let's, let's, let's think about that for a second. I never thought of it that way. They don't grow coffee and yet their brands are the most popular in the world. There's this constant pattern of with consumer culture prior to this first generation perspective, there's a constant divorcing of the product from the source. Yes. People take matcha from the source and they put it in a Western context. They take Vietnamese coffee from the, from the source, they put it in a Western or Italian context, right? They take, it's always a divorcing of products from the source. And we want to change not just coffee culture, but just consumer culture in general. We want it to be more culturally inclusive and holistic of the entire supply chain. So if you have a product that you're enjoying from Japan or from Vietnam, let's include the communities and the creators of that product yeah. in the conversation rather than saying like like for example a perfect example um are you familiar with blue bottle yes blue of, bottle course. Coffee? of course right so james freeman from blue bottle was really the first pioneer to bring over a japanese brew tool and introduce it to americans and it has now become synonymous with specialty coffee culture do you know what that brew tool is is it that is it the thing or the, the it's the c60 pour over Oh my God. The V60 pour over, right? Um, the V60 pour over is, is like a staple of specialty coffee culture today. Yeah. And it's from Japan. I didn't know right? that. See, I didn't know that. Most people don't. Some people do because of Hario, but like, it's not really a part of the conversation, right? It's uh-huh. not like, hey, we're bringing a piece of Japanese brewing culture to America and it's called the V60. Huh. Rather, it's like, this is a single serve pour over. It's called the V60, right? Right. So we want to change this process of how people engage with products and consumer culture. We want it to be culturally inclusive. So our goal then is to build the next biggest coffee brand for the world that's rooted in the source, that's rooted in the world's second largest coffee producing region, Vietnam. Um, and also, in addition, as we're doing that, May, our big, big vision is to really elevate Robusta coffee right? As the future of not just specialty coffee, but the future of sustainable coffee farming. Yeah. Because while a lot of people are, you know, are beginning to talk about a lot is how will coffee survive in the face of climate change and global warming, right? right? And we're already seeing a lot of reports about a lot of Arabica farms in you know, South America are experiencing crop failure because of climate change, right? Mm. Now, Robusta has been devalued and demeaned so much in the cultural space. However, May, 
Robusta gets its name because it's a robust plant. It's a very resilient coffee tree. In a lot of ways, it can grow better than Arabica in the face of climate change. Oh. So we believe that, yes, if we can elevate Vietnamese coffee, Robusta beans, the rise of Robusta, right, and change consumer culture perceptions here to be like, let's celebrate Arabica and let's celebrate Robusta. If we can really elevate Robusta, we will actually unlock a pathway for right. farmers all around the world to sustain their livelihoods by converting to Robusta of farming. Wow. But they cannot make Robusta if the industry says we only want Arabica. Yes. So we just sh- change this perception, this narrative, say Robusta is great too. And it'll be the rise of Robusta. Everyone's going to want Robusta. Everyone's going to ask Robusta. And then yeah. farmers will also be able to engage in Robusta farming. Wow. Talk what? about a plan for sustainability in terms of livelihood for yeah. these coffee farmers who, yeah. you know, may see the end of their days soon, sooner than later, if they don't maybe switch to robust. Wow. That's fascinating. That is a grand plan that a grand plan. totally could work. I mean, seriously. It's a grand plan. And it just is. a quick fun fact, May. So uh, Brazil, for example, has already increased their robusta production by 20% oh. in the last three seasons. Oh, interesting. Okay. So they're it's, catching on to this. It's starting to happen. Yes. Right. And we're here to expedite that because it is about economic sustainability right. as well as agricultural yeah. sustainability. And it's an issue of economic justice, right? Because right. robusta farming is actually easier to enter than a Arabica farming as well. Interesting. Right. Wow. More beans for the farmers. No, no, absolutely. And and, and livelihoods will be spared. You know, that's, yeah. that's the thing. Well, I, I want to ask you this, speaking of livelihood, tell me a personal story about the farmers that you, you know, get your coffee beans from, how their lives have changed from working with you. I mean, is there something that has happened to them? Because we want to hear from them too. Yeah. Yeah. They- yeah. They have a lot of pride. It's funny, um, you know, America still has like this cultural cachet of being America. And so they have a lot of pride to be like, wow, my coffee beans made to America. Oh. Like they say that, like, it, like it's like such a badge of honor for them. Wow. Um, and I will tell you, my producing partners in Vietnam, they've had other people reach out to them about getting their coffee. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Which is great, yeah. right? Cause now wow. other people are seeking out, I mean, Roasters are asking green bean importers for Robusta. So now green bean importers are looking for Robusta in Vietnam. So this is the power of change, right? All, all along our supply chain. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And this is the power of storytelling yes. and, you know, accurate narratives. Yes. Right? Being told. So, yes. oh, Sarah, I am so happy to hear about what you're doing and the success you've already achieved so far, but the change that you're mm-hmm. creating. Uh, which is what we all need to be doing while we're on this planet. Right? Mm-hmm. Let's not sit around on our asses and do nothing. We can all do something, yeah. uh, whether it's big or small. Yep. We can all do something for positive change. So thank you for being that kind of person uh, mm-hmm. to be willing to take that on. Um, oh. and, and at such a young age. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you say that because I'm just kind of like, I'm in my mid thirties now. Yeah, I'm yeah. putting some time. Yeah, to me, that's young. So <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I'm so happy to hear that. <laughs> no, but thank you, Sarah. It was a great, it was great finally connecting with you Likewise. Um, and continued success. Um, and I, I can tell that you're going to keep going very far because you're very driven and you're very purposeful. Mm. And I love that. So mm-hmm. keep doing the great work and we will definitely stay in touch. Thank you, May. Thank okay. you for having me. And thank you for amplifying our story. Of course. Of course. Yeah. So uh, for all of you who want more information about uh, her coffee and her coffee company, it's whencoffeesupply.com. So that's N-G-U-Y-E-N coffeesupply.com. And uh, check it out. You'll see her story and how they source the coffee and the sustainability, all of that. I think it's, it's, it's pretty incredible, sort of the vision that she has, particularly about the climate change. I thought that blew my mind, actually. Um, so check it out. And uh, thank you so much for watching, everyone, and listening. Um, and again, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, give us a review. Rate us on podcast platforms. Okay? All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.